Yo, what's going on, guys? We're here with our weekly series. It's become of NBA trade rumors. Right now, if you don't care to listen to this intro, timestamps are down below, or I, however you access them. There's the rumors. Go ahead, click on them, or go into the channel, subscribe, like, comment, do all that stuff. And there's individual videos that have been clipped from this video. So this is going to be a long video that we basically talk about all the rumors in a good you know two three minute segment and let me hear your thoughts about every single one like comment all that good jazz and let's get right into it ladies and gentlemen let me know where you guys think about the new mic placement if it sounds better whatever now the pistons who have been linked to zach levine possess multiple expiring deals that could make a framework for a trade for levine work who makes 40 million dollars zach and he's owed $138 million over the next few seasons. Multiple outlets, including, I believe this is Joe Cowley or Casey Johnson of NBC Sports Chicago, have reported that the Pistons have yet to defend, definitively make a move. Basically, the Pistons are reluctant to trade for Zach Levine because of the financial burden. Now, let's talk about why, you know, Zach Levine is in, you know, an interesting player to trade for. First off, Zach Levine, as of right now, is to miss at least another week with the foot injury. But Zach Levine this season, statistically, what he's giving you is 19 and a half points, 45% from the field, 35% from three. But he's only played 25 games this season. And the the Bulls this season are 23 and 26. They are the 21st ranked offense, and they are the 15th best defensive rating. And the thing is, is this season without Levine, the the Bulls have actually gone. It's it's kind of funny, but I believe the record this year is I want to make sure. I, Bulls record, I, I'm going on stat muse right now to make sure. And I believe it's like a winning record without Zach Levine, 13 and 11. OK, so that's just where you're at. Take that with a grain of salt. Kobe White's emerged. OK, Kobe White's got 20 points per game score. All right. Nikola Vucevic looks, you know, more comfortable out there without Levine. So does DeMar, who's dropping 22 points a night. And you got yourself. I know Pat Wills, I think he's injured right now. I believe he went down with injury. Even Caruso is having a great scoring year, shooting 41 percent from three, almost 50 from the field, 10 points a night. I would assume I am. Andre Dry, just the, the offense looks better without him there. So, but on the flip side, the Pistons, they do, they don't have an offense. Okay. It's Boyhan Bogdanovich and Cade Cunningham trying their best. And I love Cade. They're 26th ranked offense, 29th in defense. They got, you know, Cade and Boyan both putting up, you know, 23 from Cade, 21 almost from Boyan. And then you got Jaden Ivy and Jalen Dern giving you 14 and 12 and a half from, you know, Asar Thompson. I mean, Albert. And Asar is giving you eight and ten. It's bad. It's bad. And, you know, now with Danilo in his few games, he's giving you 12. But there, there's not much firing power. So, like, bringing him in is just to solve the firing power. But I don't think that's enough. Okay? I don't think that's enough. And I don't think they should be giving up that. Much, like, cap space. Cap space is going to be something that's freaking valuable. And you're in a good position where you have a lot of it, which people are going to pay you to take on shitty contracts. And by putting Zach Levine on your team, I think it impedes that. So I understand why they're reluctant. Next topic. And the rest of the video is going to be any other type of video stuff. Bye. So the Atlanta Hawks are continuing to say, hey, guys, look, we are reluctant to take on d'angelo russell even though d'angelo russell over the last few weeks has been an absolute stud the thing is, is the hawks were the 11th ranked offense 28th ranked defense that's what you need to understand they want cap flexibility and they want draft assets they want two first round picks and we're hearing continuing to hear that from this time from the the boys at i believe the athletic they're saying look trey young needs the ball in his hand d'angelo russell is going to take the ball out of his hand and Jalen Johnson, who they really like, who's averaging 16 points a game, eight rebounds, three assists, defensive dynamo, like a steal and a half and a block a game. Another guy that needs the ball in his hands. They're trying to move on from City Bay, DeAndre Hunter, and looks like Clint Capella and DeJounte Murray. Now, they understand, I they like Boyom, I mean Bogdan Bogdanovich, who's, you know, Bogdan's averaging 17 points a game. He's the third leading scorer. You know, DeAndre Hunter, he's a good utility knife, but he's not like the guy. So they, they want cap flexibility. You know, they don't want to pay the tax and they need to find a person like the Nets that we've said, 
we give him a Spencer Didwitty's expiring contract and maybe a pick if they send D'Lo and Jalen Hood if you know and that's I it's we're like a broken record at this point but the thing is is D'Lo at this point for the Lakers has been balling okay D'Lo over the last you know few weeks has been absolutely on a tear who the Lakers le third leading scorer at this point is D'Angelo Russell who's out here you got 225 points per game scores in Davis and James and D'Lo's best stretch of his career was with the Nets he's out here averaging 17 points on the season and D'Lo in January has just been absolutely you know insane and I think that's the the, the crazy part with you know D'Angelo Russell is that this January he averaged 23.6 assists so I just he looked good and I think the the Lakers are also like they need to fix their defense okay like then the same thing with the Hawks. Both teams, their their problem is defense. I mean, the the Lakers is a little bit their three point shooting is like league average, but defense is their 14th ranked, and their offense is. I mean, for the Lakers, it is offense. They need a facilitator. I think it's both sides of the balls. I just don't think this is the best. I think the Lakers are trying not to like gut themselves. So Caruso is not expected to be traded. Like they shouldn't trade him, in my opinion. I we talked about it earlier. This is a team that's. They're coming around. First off, Greaves is having a career year. He's shooting like 49% from the field, 41% from three. 10 points a night, dude. Oof. He's an absolute dog. He, he can score on all three levels. He's not like a facilitator or a primary playmaker or like a, a shot creator, but like he can do it off like transition. And like, you know, if he has a guy like Kobe White, Vooch, and like DeMar DeRozan, he's creating for him, it's it's going to be good. And a good coach like Billy Donovan is going to put him in success. I mean, this is a team that, you know, 23 and 26. So basically what they're they're saying over here, ESPN saying is that the Bulls have six days to decide if they want to hang on to them and continue being a playing team. They're ninth in the East. But that the, the whole thing is, is like, yes, they're ninth in the East. Yeah, like you can give them crap for that. But if you look at the standings, they are literally three games behind the Heat and the Magic who are, you know, still playing teams. But realistically, they're not that far away from being a team that could realistically you know, four games behind the Pacers who are the six seed. So their fortunes could change, you know, other teams' fortunes. And several playoff teams have obviously been calling all year about Caruso. And, you know, we'll have more reporting in this video about it. But the Bulls could end up trading him because two protected first-round picks could end up creating this bidding war. And you kind of, you got to sell high when you can. That's all I'm going to say. Like, you got to sell high sometimes, even if you don't want to. They're saying this Miles Bridges stuff is legit. Jake Fisher, good man from Yahoo Sports. I'm just going to argue right here. I don't think it's going to happen because if they trade Miles Bridges, Miles Bridges loses his bird rights. This is before we continue, we start this video. You guys need to be aware of this. If Miles Bridges waits to the offseason, he can be signed and traded and signed by the Hornets with a, to a contract, a max contract, using his bird rights, which pays him more and then be signed and traded to a team. While if he is traded now to the Suns, it'll merely be a rental because he loses his bird rights and then he can only sign a non-bird rights max, which he uh, loses a significant amount of money. Take that for however you want. That's my two cents. I think Miles Bridges camp is gonna say, we're cool finishing the year with the Hornets. Now let's read what Jake Fisher says. As for the Charlotte wing, Miles Bridges, the Phoenix Suns continue to just be subscribed by league personnel as a team most motivated to land the Michigan State product. It should be noted Bridges uh, hails from the same Spartan program that, you know, new owner Matt Ishbia was well, part of the legendary coach Tom Izzo. Bridges would obviously add, you know, a guy who can play the two, the three, the four. In a pinch, he's a strong rebounder. He's a 20 points per game scorer. He's a good two-way player. He's, you know, he gives them, you know, some basically some depth at the forward he basically get fixes their problem instead of having to play josh kogi and the boys the sons can now rely on miles bridges now nazir little would be able to get the deal done okay nazir little and package with some of the the contracts to get the deal done and you're thinking why would they do this i mean kevin durant Devin booker averaging 28 points a night bradley beals averaging 17 a night and they're the ninth best offense, 16th best defense, 11th in net rating, and they're the 7th in three-point percentage. And then you got Grayson Allen, fourth leading scorer with 13 points a night. Eric Gordon out here also averaging 13. Yosem Nurkic giving you 12 and 10. And then Drew Eubanks is your, you know, 
seventh leading Tory at five points. It drops hard, but you know, the idea is you send over Naz Little and whatever young assets they would like. You don't have much, it's give them the cupboard because the Suns draft picks. Okay, you want to hear what the Suns have draft wise, draft picks wise? This is what the Suns have draft picks wise. It's it's not it's not pretty, okay. So their future picks that they can trade, I believe is the 2024 protected 31 to 54 from San Antonio, the 2026 second from either Detroit, Milwaukee, Orlando, no protection, 28 from Memphis, a second round, 28 from Boston protected 31 to 45 and a 29 Memphis, no protection. So, you know, you want five first round picks. I don't, dude, that's like what Rui Hodge or more I got traded for last year or whatever it was. I don't know guys. What do you think if you're a Suns or a Hornets fan? I just think that would be high rate robbery. I think the better deal is just the wait to the offseason. Unless the situation is that bad that they have to get rid of him. I just don't see it. This one is obvious. Gabe Vincent's on the block. It just didn't work. Seriously, it just didn't work. And that's sometimes that happens. 25 and 25, the Los Angeles Lakers, 9th in the West, 20th offensive rating, 14th in defensive rating. They're negative 1.2 in net rating, 15th in basically average in three point percentage and look now you got davis and lebron averaging 25 a night 17 from russell 15 and a half from reeves and rui's been you know 12 points a game 10 from torian prince christian wood seven cam reddish seven and then gabe vincent who's played five games and gabe vincent in those five games has not been pretty and i know gabe vincent like you know jared vanderbilt just went down with an injury and gabe vincent has not played since you know I think it's now before Christmas. It's not been pretty. It has it been his fault? He underwent an anthroscopic, anthroscopic surgical procedure on his left knee on the 27th of December, and they were saying that was going to keep him out for two months, which means beginning of March he's supposed to come back. End of February. What are you getting with Game Vincent? In theory, okay, what did they think they were getting with him? It's $10 million. I think they've been looking for deals. Look, he was a guy who was an outside shooter, solid outside shooter. I called him the Nigerian devil himself. He's a guy who's going to put up sh shots, good guy off the bench. He's got a little scoring off the dribble against closeouts. You know, for the position, he plays point guard, undersized combo guard. It's all right, a ball handler. For his size, he's a solid defender. He's limited. He's feisty, but like, obviously, you know, he's limited. W what are you, what are we trading him for? Realistically, guys, realistically, Jay Sean Tate. Is that what we're going to go out and get? That's, that's where it becomes hard to tell. Hey guys, seriously, like who could we go ahead and trade for? I don't know if that's the, the right, the right move. Because uh, the way I look at this is, hey, I'm all for, you know, looking at a team, okay, and like the Lakers, let's just go right there, like the Lakers who who have a have a bunch have a bunch of moves that they can make, and ten and a half million dollars is like not that small of a salary, like they're they're. If you just want to, if you want to put Jalen Hood Shafino, and that's like fifteen million dollars we can trade, okay? For fifteen million dollars, I think you can go out and get yourself PJ Washington. You can go out and get yourself Kevin Herter. These, I'm just listing people off. I'm not saying they should get, get these guys, okay? Tyus Jones, they can go out and get Dorian Finney-Smith. They can go out and get Doug McDermott, Gary Harris. Maybe not. I don't know if they could probably Nasri. Grant Williams definitely. Dennis Schroeder, Kelly Olynyk. These are all people that they could use that contract to trade for. Again, I'm not saying that they should, okay? I'm just saying that it, realistically, that's something that you can you could see. And at this point, ten and a half million dollars, is it worth going out and getting trying to get Caruso, Bruce Brown? You know, it, that's the decision you have to make at the Lakers. Let me hear your thoughts. So Charlotte's considering trading Kyle Lowry again, and it. I was told that, you know, Kyle Lowry is just going to straight up get traded. And the Hornets this season, if you guys haven't been paying attention, from what I've understood, even though, I mean, they're under talented. I love Steve Clifford. I think his time as being a head coach is a little bit past. I think he was kind of the David Tully, the Levy Smith of NBA hirings. 
Now, with the new owners, they're going to clean house and put in their guys, maybe move Mitch Kupchak to a, you know, to a role. I hope Colt Teal, the Greensboro Swarm GM, gets promoted. You guys might understand why. But either way, this is a team that's the worst defense in the league. Third worst offense in the league. 23 points a night was their leading scorer in Terry Rozier. But LaMelo Ball... You know, when healthy was their other leading scorer. Now it's Miles Bridges. Then you got Brandon Miller, who has been on a tear. He's been, you know what? They were smart for skipping Scoot. I, I'll admit, I gave him flack, and I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong. And Brandon Miller just looks fantastic. That mold, that's the mold you need in the NBA today. Gordon Hayward's a great expiring, but supposedly, unless he gets traded, he won't accept the buyout because he's never going to get $31 million. P.J. Washington's averaging 14 points a night, 13 from Mark Williams, who's, you know, been injured this year. Nick Richards, who's been a super solid and giving you, you know, 10 and 8. And Cody Martin, another guy, injury. And, you know, Nick Smith's giving you flashes. Bryce McGowan, same thing. And I think it's been it's been an interesting roster because you got JT Thor, who, you know, he used to be really good defensively. He kind of went back a little bit this year. So you look at this team and Kyle Lowry, who it's, it makes sense that they're not going to keep him here because this is a rebuilding, a rebuilding team. And PJ Washington, Nick Richards, Nick Richards, I believe, what, like seven, eight million dollars right there. PJ's making like sixteen. You got Gordon, who's giving you thirty-two. And for me, when I look here, like PJ Washington, they traded Terry Rozier. They're starting the rebuild around Lamella, Brandon Miller, and Mark Williams, which is great. And Washington's probably the veteran that has the least urgency to be moved. They signed him to that three-year, forty-eight million dollar deal after a protracted restricted free agency. And it's not. A surprise that they want to give him off the books, but this hasn't been the best year for him. He's struggled to shoot the three. He's been reduced role as they integrate, reintegrate Miles Bridges and, you know, have Brandon Miller ascending. His role is weird. You know, he started the season averaging 17 and six, and then after that, it's been rough, and he's been benched in favor of Bridges, and then he's missed some time with injuries, but it's like him. They could wait. He's only 25 years old. They're theoretically entering his prime. Wait till the offseason to get a good draft or prospect capital for him instead of, you know, feeling like they have to move him now. Now, I think with Gordon Hayward, you know, for this year, he's been useful as a secondary playmaker. He's shooting, you know, at 50% field goal, 39 from three. I think last we checked. You know, the Sixers, Warriors, and Heat, he's supposedly a guy who gave you multiple high second round picks in value. They're saying PJ Washington's a late first round pick and or equivalent value. They're saying I think the Cavs are a great fit for him. They're saying the Mavs are another good one in the Kings. I think the Mavs, the Kings, they must miss out on somebody. I think the Cav the Kings and Mavs, they would have to miss out on somebody. I think the Cavs are the best bet to go out and get him. While Bucks and Warriors, they're saying the athletic right here for PJ Washington. It's definitely interesting. And then we go over to Kyle Lauer, who's now here. I think he's just a solid matching guy for a bigger deal. I just can't see, you know, they're saying the Raptors, Warriors, Lakers, unless this is like a Chris Paul or the the Raptors really trying to get off of Otto Porter, Thad Young, and Gary Trent or some combination of this. I, I just can't see, you know, people around there. So it's really just to use them as a mechanism. I want to hear your thought right there. So we're hearing our man, Mr. Yes. Lovely Marcus Smart. He's a guy that could be on the move. I know we've already heard like the Grizzlies and Gri Grizzlies beat writers and people refute it. Sorry, I'm like making sure my seat. Also, tell me how the mic is. New mic position. Now, specifically, the Bucks and Lakers are among the teams who have reached out, according to Jake Fisher of Yahoo Sports, for the Grizzlies on a potential trade. The Grizzlies have shut down all interest in trading Smart. Memphis sent out two first-round picks and, Ty and Tyus Jones in order to acquire him last season. He signed through the 25-26 season as part of his four-year $77 million deal. Makes sense that they don't want to trade him. We know the Lakers, you know, Vanderbilt's out for a few weeks now with an injury, and the Lakers are a team that their offense has been struggling this year. And for me, the, the Grizzlies, they're a team that, yeah, this is just a gap year. Crap went wrong. But they're the eighth best defense, and Marcus Smart's a big part of that. And they're obviously the worst offense in the league. I still think over here you got 25 a night from John Moran in those nine games. You had Desmond Bain over here being 24 and a half point for game score, 22 from Jaron Jackson, then 15 in the night, basically 14 and a half from Marcus Smart with, you know, Santi Alma, Luke Kennard, and our boys out uh, being the Vince Williams, man. Scotty Pippen, I guess now you could say, being part of you know the rest of the scoring budget. It's been rough, and you, I think getting rid of Smart would just 
it, it would cause a lot more problems than benefits. If they traded smart is because they're on a mandate from a owner, okay, to, to trade him. And I, I cannot personally see him being traded in my personal opinion. It just does not make sense. The, the bucks it's again, Marcus smart this season. If you guys don't know is making, I believe it's, I think it's like 13. I'm going to be wrong on this, but smart 18.5. Yeah, that was off by five, but 18.5. And he's a good guy. You can play. He's a combo guard. He can also play the wing. He can also play point. You can he pass the ball. He's a good playmaker, better as a secondary. Same thing with shot creation. The former defensive player of the year. You just don't trade that type of guy. And especially if they trade, it be on a mandate from ownership or somebody to recover the picks. And again, 18.5. Lakers don't have crap to offer you that. D-Lo, Gabe Vincent, Rui Achimura, Austin Ripps. They, they just, no. And then the Bucks. What are the Bucks going to send you? Oh, Bobby Porter's in back on it. And yeah. The, then the picks. It's just not there. Don't believe it. Move on from this one. I definitely think this one about Nick Claxton is interesting as we're hearing right here. Nick Claxton's more available, according to Mark Stein at the Stein line, than we initially thought leading up to the trade deadline. As Claxton, supposedly want somebody that more available than previously advertised. The question surrounding the Nets' long-term plans with Claxton, he's making 9.6 this year. As the center is set to become an unrestricted free agency, we know that Dorian Finney-Smith, Royce O'Neal, and Spencer Dinwiddie are also supposedly guys that are most likely to be traded before the deadline. This year, the Nets, you know, they started the season out, I think it was like, 13 and something it was a solid start their 17th offensive rating 115.8 117 point 117 defensive rating which is 18th and they're minus 1.2 which is 19th net rating and their league average 36.5 percent three-point shooting team now they're led by 22 points per game mikhail bridges who was supposed to be an all-star just didn't can what we thought was going to carry over didn't carry over Cam Thomas is a legit 20 points per game score, but he's probably better off the bench role. Mikhail's probably more suited to be a co-star, not the superstar. Cam Johnson, also a guy that we thought was going to be a 20 points per game score because of an amazing playoff series. It's a 14 points per game guy. He is who we thought he was. Spencer didn't he's supposed to be. Again, this is the media saying is a guy who's a cancer guy. He's averaging 13 tonight. Nick Clarkson's averaging 12 and a half and 10 and a half. His defense has kind of fallen off the 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 floor and with cleaning the glass if we look over here it's not necessarily the prettiest let me confirm right here what i got with cleaning the glass what we're, we're what we're seeing right here is a hey, i'm not trying to like disparage him but i think the big problem is nick claxon just it went down and who's trading for it? it's 9.6 it's going to be a team that wants a backup center like could the Clippers trade P.J. Tucker and Bones Highland for Nick Claxton? I kind of think that's a good deal. If I'm the Nets, I think that's a good deal. I think that's a bargain deal. If you know you're going to lose Nick Claxton, don't lose the guy for nothing, okay? I think that's my that's my big thing. Like, you can't let the guy be gone for nothing. So let's see what here what we're hearing. The Athletic has, like, this big board that they're doing, which honestly has been really good, and they've done a, a good job of putting it together. So I want to I want to hear you guys' opinions on what you think that of their their opinions I guess we could say on the current situation with Nick Claxton and I'm actually like super surprised by the the fact that he's a guy that they don't want to resign I think the big problem with them is we just don't know what his value is and I think that's the the biggest thing is trying to figure out what is Nicholas Claxton's value just he's a springy guy He's playing good, you know, when he plays good, he shot 70% from the field last year, like solid dude when his stats are identical, but the efficiency went down this year is the big thing. And when you look at him, what are you realistically getting? You're getting guys tall, lanky, he can switch out on guards, you know, the effort level, sometimes you could say is questionable. And this year he went from his points per shot attempt, went from being in the 90, basically the 92, 93rd percentile for back-to-back -back seasons to the 66 percentile. And his, just his turnover rates is just, you know, it, it went, it went down, which is good. But if you look over here, defensive rebounding, his block rate still, you know, 92 percentile last year was 98, but the steal went from 73rd percentile to 50 percentile. And, Again, 
the the fact that the I think he's he's became a better rebounder, but defensively he's just not where he was you know, a year ago. And I I thought the he just was you know literally ninety five percentile back to back years effective field goal percentage. That's absurd. Ninety four percentile in two point percentage, you know, and now he's seventy six percentile on effective field goal percentage and seventy just it's bad and Dayron Sharp's a dog. Okay, that's the big problem, guys. Dayron Sharp is when healthy, dude. This guy in thirty-seven games, sixteen minutes a night, is averaging seven, seven rebounds, seven and a half points. It's like if he was playing thirty-two minutes a night, he would be averaging fifteen points and fourteen rebounds with two blocks, one steal, three assists. It's it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing going on right there. So. I'm I'm on camp Deron Sharp right here. Look, give my man Deron minutes. Maybe trade, you know, Claxton for Wendell Carter. I don't know what's going on here. I gotta ask my coworker Michael Scotto, but the Nets rejected two first round picks for Dorian Finney Smith. And it's weird because the Nets, you know, they started off the season a bit, you know, better than we thought they were gonna be a better team than they they've been. Okay. And for me, the big thing right here is this is a team 17th in offensive rating, 18th in defensive rating, minus 1.2 net rating, league average three point shooting team, 36 and a half percent, two 22 points per game score, and Mikhail and Cam Thomas. But you know, Cam's more of a six man, Mikhail's more of a co star. And then they're saying Spencer Didwitty and Nick Claxton, Dorian Finney Smith, Royce O'Neill are all guys who could be traded. And I think first off, if you're getting offered two first round picks, what are we doing, guys? Because Brian Lewis of New York Post is reporting that the they've rejected a two first round pick deal. They're supposedly they have interest from the Lakers, Mavs, Bucks, Thunders, Suns, and Kings. Dorian Finney Smith is averaging nine points and five rebounds this year. He's a multi positional defender. He can guard one through five. He's a good rebounder, great three point shooter. He's on a multi year deal. All right. So, Lakers did not offer multiple picks. Okay. The Bucks did not offer multiple first round picks. So, this either has to be the Thunder or the Kings. I don't think the Mavs did either, nor did the Suns. So, we can rule out the Lakers, the Bucks, and the Suns offering multiple first round picks and the Mavs. I think it was really the Thunder who offered multiple first round picks and they probably offered a shitty contract. So, it was like, here's one first round pick for the shitty deal yeah, like the shitty contract you got to take on and here's another one for the thing for the the player but that's where it becomes it probably weren't valuable picks if they're turning them down because i don't think they're in a position because there aren't many brooklyn next players yet because frankly teams around the leagues aren't entirely sure what direction they're going to go that includes during finney smith who's like an excellent player and since he signed long term the nets are in no rush to make a decision in on his future as they sit in the eastern conference play-in tournament right now like this is a team that is 19 and 28 all right guess how many games behind the six seed they are the six seed is i believe it's what i want to say 10 games behind it's the Pacers and the Pacers are 10 games. Yeah. So they are four and a half games away from being in the six seed. So why, we'll or my apology, there's seven games. So that's actually farther away. I was looking at a different one. So yeah, I mean, they're, they're not even in the play anymore. They're 11th after. So dude, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. So it's hard to decide where they're going to go. Why? I don't know, man. And looking at the, like Royce and Neil, I love Royce. Royce, you can get multiple second round picks. He's a guy who could play the two, the three, or the four. I love him. And it's it's difficult to gauge where everything's going to go. But if you're a Nets fan, man, it's rough. It's rough out in these streets. I'll admit, okay? So I want to hear your thoughts on this one. Mr. Mark Stein of the Stein Line Substack is reporting that, yes, Mr. Colin Sexton could be on the move. No. Just kidding, ladies and gentlemen. He's saying it is unlikely because this guy's been playing like a dog. Sorry, or we had like a lag in for a second. But Colin Sexton is a guy that, nope, Mark Stein saying not trading. Why would you trade this guy if you guys have not been paying attention? 21.6 points, five and a half assists, and 26 starts this season for the Jazz. Jordan Clarkson, Kelly Olenek, and Taylor Horton Tucker are the most likely guys to be traded by Utah. And you're thinking, why? Because first off, 
the the Jazz this season have turned around their fortunes. They were looking like they were going to be a team that was going to have a gap year, but instead they're saying, "Hey guys, now nah, we're not having a gap year." Yes, they're the 25th ranked defense, but they're 15th in offensive rating, minus 2.3 in net rating, 23rd in three-point shooting with a 35.6 35.7% three-point shot, but 24 points a night from Larry Markin and 18 from Jordan Clarkson, 17 and a half on the season. Colin Sexton, but again, he's a 21 point per game score. Jordan Clon, Jordan Car Jordan, John Collins has found guys. I've butchered names this. Larry Market and Jordan Clarkson, Colin Sexton have all been fantastic. John Collins started the season rough, but now he's a dead eye shooting 52% from the field, 35 from three, grabbing eight boards, blocking a shot a game, and getting 14 points. Simone Fontecchio has found a role being a three point shooter. Walker Kessler still playing good defense, but Taylor or Tucker, Kelly Olenek. All makes sense to be on the move. Same thing. Jordan Clarkson probably just want to cash in on that. Ochai Baji starting to you know make his way there. Chris Dunn's been a great story. So when you look at here, I I just think it makes sense that they don't want to get rid of Colin Sexton because this is a team that right now they're tenth in the West. Seriously, they're tenth in the West. They're a team that is three games behind the Mavericks for the eighth seed, and they're five games behind the Suns for the the sixth seed. So they're for a lot can change very quickly this is a team that's one of the top rebounding teams in the league one of the best passing teams in the league they put up a shit ton of shots and they're they're figuring out the core it was a gap year now they're figuring out the core and i think they know that lowry sexton and george are guys they want to have long term it looks like and obviously walker kessler so i like what they're figuring out here and i don't think they want to force it and they shouldn't so I think they're doing a good job right here. Let me hear your thoughts if you're a Jazz fan, what you guys are doing, and if you guys agree with my analysis. I just think over the last like few weeks, this is just a team that, look, they've, they've been doing, I know they're on a three-game skid as we make this video, but you just, the deal that Sexton's on is just too good to let the want to move off of it. So that's, that's my two cents on that matter. But let's go ahead and move on from this. Let me hear your thoughts on that, but I love y'all. Yeah, seriously. I heard on the athletic podcast, oh well, damn, when I was driving home, they were talking about this on the way home from school. But and then on this morning on the NBA show, link in the description, we we're talking about this. But Jalen Green supposedly generating trade buzz. He's actually, according to Hoops Hype's global rating, the 61st ranked player in the NBA, having a great year under MA Udoka. After I think the problem with Jalen Green is a combination of the G League Ignite and Steven Siles just basically four years until MA Udoka got here of terrible player development coaching where they just say, go out there and do whatever the heck you want. Figure it out, kid. And for a guy who, yes, we knew he is basically his potential was coming out. We always knew this. He was going to be a guy who was going to be very similar to Zach Levine. That's no offense. Okay. Like he was a guy who's going to be able to get buckets, a guy that. You know, solid player, solid player. But, you know, there, he was a big green. And we're hearing from ESPN, Zach Lowe, and people from The Athletic that he was in the Rockets who are, you know, seeking their first playoff berth. And they are loaded with picks, have good enough young players. And Green's averaging 18.5 points, five rebounds, three and a half assists. And he's, you know, became more of a complimentary piece than an actual main piece. So he's a guy that could surprise people and be traded now what is Jalen green's trade value that's where it's hard it's it's hard because i want to say he's a guy who has value but at the same time i don't know how much that is like when i look at him he's a young dude He's still on his con a young contract. So you think, okay, easily a first round pick. And I feel that teams like, I seriously think teams like the Jazz, maybe even Orlando, the Kings, uh, even re like contending teams could go ahead and try to get a guy like him over here. And I just, I just think it, it could be a worthy investment because you get his bird rights and you can extend him cheap. So that is something that you're thinking like, oh, damn, I'll be able to like extend him and he'll be able to 
you know, the Nets are a team that I think that should look into this and it won't cost. I think it's a pick and a prospect or a pick and a good player. So like if he's making $9 million per se, okay. And if he, uh, the Spurs could be a great team. I think, I think Portland's not there because Portland's where he got Shaden, Anthony Simons and Scoop. That's a log jam. Brooklyn, I think Cam Thomas and Jalen Green, the defense might not be there. But the Spurs are a team that they could go over here and be like, hey, we got a lot of, you know, we got Zach Collins. We got a few guys. We got picks. Or Orlando could be like Gary Harris could shape him or you could trade you Gary Harris. I think there are some teams out there that could benefit from him. Or a contending team like the Suns or Bucks could be like, dude, we'll take him. Here's Naz Little and like Bull Bull and whoever the heck you want. Do it. <laughs> but I think you got to do a first round pick at least if like. It, yeah, they, they want a first round pick. Tell the world that I'm coming home. Right? I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Tell the world that I'm coming home. I don't know. Warriors are pulling Jonathan Kaminga from trade talks, according to Jake Fisher of Yahoo Sports. The Golden State Warriors have removed Jonathan Kaminga from trade discussions following his recent surge in play. He's like a 25 points per game scorer. And Kaminga's future with uh, the Warriors had been uncertain this past offseason. Supposedly, they were packaging him with their the pick that they took put a Jemski with to the King to the Pistons. My apology, the Pistons for the seventh pick, but they you know didn't anything happen. And then supposedly, he had reportedly lost faith in January playing for Steve Kerr. But now Kaminga was supposedly almost got a guy that they, the the Pacers really wanted. And now they're like, Nah, buddy. Guess what, Kaminga, you're staying. All right, last ten games. Is a guy who's average. Listen to this: twenty-one point six rebounds and two assists. The Warriors this season—it's been a dumpster for them. Twelfth in the West. They're, well, I think, I think at this point they're six games behind the six seed, one game behind the tenth seed. They're the tenth best offense, twenty-second best defense. They're minus zero point two net rating, which is sixteenth, and they're thirty-seven point six from three, which is league average. But if you look over here, this is a team, yeah, 28 points a night from Curry, 18 from Thompson. Kaminga, obviously on the season's 15, 12 and a half from Wiggins. It's been bad, but he's actually been really been better this year. Sarge has been good. Then you got yourself a, a bunch of guys that I think definitely are, I think, you know, stoked, but I like that like have been good role players draymond green's been solid when he has played been suspended a lot Mo moody's been good but like <sighs> there's no one worth trading for that's the whole problem there's no one that they should trade for that's the problem that's the problem supposedly chris paul and wiggins are available for trade but i just don't think there's anyone really available just wait till the offseason guys the hawks continue to ask for austin reeds from a lakers trade We've known that they don't want D'Lo, but we're hearing now that they want Austin Reeves, according to Adrian Wojnarowski at ESPN. And this is a team that the the Lakers they're ranked right now 20th in offense. I think they're 18th in defense. They're a better defensive team than they are offensively. League average three point shooting team, 25 points per game scores in both Davis and LeBron. They've got 17 points per game again a night from D'Lo over the last several weeks. He's been like insane. But the thing is, is that we've the deal that we've heard is D'Lo, Jalen Huchifino to the Nets. Nets send Spencer Dinwiddie and a pick to the Hawks. Lakers additionally send the 29 pick to the Hawks. Hawks send Murray to the Lakers. Supposedly, it seems like Nets and Hawks aren't for that. Hawks are going, give us Austin Reeves and Jalen Huchifino and the and a pick and the lakers are like nah so it seems like the hawks continue to make the jante murray trade talks interesting as the lakers seem to be not willing to give up reeves and supposedly that's been a non-starter and the lakers and hawks have not advanced in talks they could engage again before the deadline for the lakers their optionality increases in the offseason when they can send up to three first round picks just opposed to one currently so that is something that is holding them back from you know feeling desperate and having to make a move Dejounte murray's the best player available for trade right now hawks are seeking two first round picks but they seem to be willing to go with a first round pick one first round pick unprotected and a 
prospect. We're hearing Lakers, Warriors, Heat, Nets, Knicks, Magic, and Pelicans could all be interested. They traded three first round picks, hoping that this pairing would allow you know Murray to be on off ball, Young be on off ball, but they're hemorrhaging. Okay, like it's not working. And Murray's made strides as a three point shooter, back to back years, almost shooting 40%. He's not that all defensive player anymore. He still gets you know steals but he's not as engaged as a lot you know as he used to be he's not that all defensive team member but i mean i think the hawks will wait till the summer to trade him because i don't think they're gonna get the deal they want and i just think it's better if they keep him my two cents warriors have no interest in trading draymond green or clay thompson we are additionally that the warriors are unlikely to make a major move ahead the deadline these reports are coming from Brian Windowhorse of ESPN and Anthony Slater of The Athletic. So Golden State Warriors continue to have no interest in trading Draymond Green or Klay Thompson, according to ESPN's Brian Windowhorse. This is a team that's 12th in the West, a game behind the, the 10th seed, five game, six games away from the 6th seed. They're the 10th best offense, 22nd in defensive rating, which is the 8th worst in the league. They're minus 0 0.2 in net rating, which is 16th, and they're 10th three-point and three-point percentage. They're led by Curry's averaging 28 points. Klay Thompson's taking a step back, averaging 18 points a night in his expiring contract. Wiggins has had a rough year, but it's been better as of late. Kaminga's been on a tear as of late, but, you know, we all know how that's been going. Draymond Green, the suspensions and all that, it's been a mess. But ESPN's Ramona Shelburne added that the Warriors – aren't considering breaking up their long-term core unless curry has a say in pushing for a split suppose the warriors are open to trading chris paul and wiggins paul's making 30.8 this season and has a unguaranteed non-guaranteed 30 million dollars next year while wiggins is making 24.3 he's owed 84.7 through 26 to 27 which that final year is a player option which he's he's just had one rough year he had a broken rib last year and just didn't work out went through a family problem this year i think wiggins is good bounce back but we're hearing, though, from Golden State Warriors beat writer Anthony Slater that they're not expected to make a major move. The Warriors remain competitive or motivated to win this season, but some believe their chances of competing at title are remote considering their current level of play and you know being outside of the playoffs. They are described as having tepid at best interest in DeJounte Murray. The Warriors have a greater need and desire for the wing or big position. Lyra Markkinen is a player that fits that mold, but he's not truly available and rival teams could easily beat their offers. Now Wiggins, like we've said, is the most available player. Then it's Paul, but they've only been discussed for player for player offers, and that just won't happen unless a draft pick is attached. So Wiggins has played better of late, especially with Kaminga and Green on the floor. So I think that's just changing things in my opinion. But I mean, I'm always down to hear what you guys have to think. I don't think they're going to do anything. It makes no sense. I don't think they're in any sort of rush to do anything along that. I think it would just be a rash move, but I mean, I'm willing to hear what you guys think because it's definitely an interesting situation because this is a team that won championships with this core that they've had. So it's, it's worked before they just need to figure out the role players. And I think that's the biggest problem in my opinion, but what do I know? I love Jay Sean Tate's story from Ohio State, went overseas, proved himself, came back over, played in Australia. Kelly Aiko and Sam, Sam and Mack and Shams Rania say that Boston Celtics and Phoenix Suns are both registered interest in the Houston Rockets wing, Jashawn Tate. The guy, he, he hasn't been as good as he has in the past in terms of shooting, but Jay Sean Tate's still a guy that has skill. To be an effective nba player in my opinion this year he's a guy who is yes shooting career low 47.7 percent but he is playing career low 18 minutes a night five points three rebounds assist a night 29 percent from three but if you look at you know the first two seasons he's a guy who can average 11 points a night and you know 26 27 minutes a night and be a 50 percent from the field shooter 30 31 percent from three where like at least like you have to respect the three-point shot like he'll take them okay and you have to respect it. and he's a guy who's left-handed he's actually a decent ball handler he can guard one through four and for me you know he's a decent athlete very high iq competes really hard on both ends of the floor can finish with traffic solid playmaker good rebounder 230 pounds and he makes six and a half million dollars has a team option for next season at 7.1 that's a reasonable salary for both of those teams Boston could use 
contracts of minimum salary players to match Tate's while the Suns could offer Nazir Lettel or package minimum players to do that deal. If you specifically would like to hear what that would look like, who the Boston Celtics would offer. Boston would offer more than likely it would be a package of like, mm, I'd assume O'Shea Brissett, Lamar Stevens, and Delano Banton, Svi Mikhailu is that like package three or four of those players while the the sun and then you know the suns would probably offer a similar package of damian lee kia to base the up yup yup chemsey metu you don't want as guys that they could offer if you if they they really want to make that move i love Deshaun tate i think he's better suited for the celtics i think the celtics would freaking love him they would love him we also know jock landau is available and for me yeah when i look at this that you know Deshaun tate could be available i think man dude i would jump on that we know that the nuggets and heat are also in boxer teams but you know supposedly they don't some people are not envisioning him being traded this season as rafael stone is a widely known huge fan of Deshaun tate but his roles you know dwindled with dylan brooks there you know it makes it hard and the problem is when tar eason and dylan brooks are hurt or don't play tate plays okay and he's appeared to be behind brooks eason jalen green jabari smith in the picking order of the wing and four this season and cam whitmore's rise and Amon thompson's you know getting minutes it's just it's becoming harder and harder but tate could be a good veteran for a team like i said for the bucks or you know the celtics i think the nuggets and he could offer better things he's a guy that you know people like he's relatively cheap contract athletic defensive minded unselfish it's multiple second round picks are definitely going to be able to prime away but yeah it's all Raphael stones you know love boy i really hope we don't trade kyle kuzma but supposedly the the two first round picks is overblown david aldridge and josh robbins two well-known dc insiders for the athletic, the rumor that it, for the two first round picks, it's overblown. He's averaging 22 points, four and a half assists, both career highs. And the Kings and Mavs are teams that we know that are interested. The Wizards this season, my Wizards, you guys know I'm a huge Wizards fan from Balmo, man. We're, 20, we're the fifth worst offense, third worst, fourth worst defense. We're the third worst net rating minus 8.7. We're 35% three-point shooting team. We our leading rebounder is Gaffer. Basically, everyone's available except Cord Kespert, Denny Avdia, and Bilal Koulibaly. With Jordan Poole averaging 17 points a night and shooting 41 and a half percent from the field, and, you know, dishing out three points. It's crazy that Kuzma's dishing out more assists. Kuzma's also re- like what two years removed from like averaging 10 assists a game. I mean, 10 rebounds a game. What was it? Two years ago? I want to say it was two years ago. He averaged 10 rebounds a game. Eight and a half. He averaged in 21 to 22. It's steadily gone down, but like he's shown that he can be a guy who can almost average a double double. Breakout years for both Denny Avdia and Corey Kasper. Both eyes are balling. But yeah, over here on the athletic, they have this big board where they have like players like, you know, value there. They say the Kings heat maps are all teams that are interested. makes sense that Kings wanted him in the off season. They want to pay. He's on a bargain, you know, four year, $90 million deal that eventually gets down to 19.4 in the 26th to 27th season. And I personally think he's underrated. He's on a bad team being a 20 point per game score. We've seen that he's on a championship team. He's about 13 point per game score. He's a good 34 option on, a you know, good team he's a good shot creator good shooter he can play the three or the four he can even be a small ball five he can create second for guys well, as a secondary playmaker he can get out and transition run he can even play defense obviously it's not been up to par but he's proven in the past that he can be this switchable defender go out on the guards he can even go inside against big obviously he's not a defensive stopper all defensive but you know he's a, he can be a plus defensive guy who brings some real offensive value and supposedly a first round and a prospect is the, the the price tag but it's going to be interesting i think they'll maintain his value into the summer and you know wait for that deal to arrive and not push it that's just my opinion i think they they know they can probably get a decent deal if they just wait it out instead of you know being a bit overzealous and forcing it instead of waiting pj tucker and bones island yeah um, could this be the package for miles bridges <laughs> I think there's a lot of deals that they could use that for. So when you look around the league, we're hearing that the Clippers, I think they're going to keep PJ Tucker, keep him ready for the playoffs. They need him. 
Bones Highland, I could see them moving, but my coworker Michael Scotto of Hoop Types says that you know they're gauging the trade market. Highlands has a year. You basically be a year and a half. He's a free agent in 25. You get restricted free agency. And Tucker hasn't played since November 27th. He's not expected to do a buyout. Should he not get traded? And at this point, what are you? What are you? What are you getting? Okay, I personally get that PJ's. They they want to keep PJ. You know he's gonna be a guy who can rebound, guard multiple positions, hit corner threes. That's it. While Bones Highlands a microwave, it's see yeah you know, some some people seem to be a fan of his, some seem not to be a fan of his. But what are you getting yourself with those contracts? So PJ this season is making specifically eleven million dollars, while Bones is this season making two. 0.3 so if you mix those contracts together you get yourself about 13 14 million dollars that you can trade for so who would you trade for for like that 14 million dollars range that's even worth it if you're if you're them i mean we've heard that miles bridges is somebody that they could want maybe it's miles bridges and nick richards that they try to get with that deal i don't really think that's the deal that would be able to get done do they call up and try to get like vasilia mizic and you know a couple guys from the thunder for cheap do they call up a team you know and then try to get like Tyus Jones. I think there there's a plethora of packages that the team like the Clippers could get. I think, you know, I think they're interested in getting like a Daniel Gafford, like a backup big would be huge for them. I think they realize they need another, they would like to have a three big man rotation. Plumlee, Tice and Zubots is great, but I think they want someone else. I don't know, maybe that's just me. Maybe more of a power forward. I mean, in a in a, a dream scenario, I think they PJ Washington would be also be someone that they would be interested. You could play that those multiple positions, or like a Nas Reed. But you know, obviously, beggars can't be choosers. The Rockets have made an aggressive offer to the Nets for Mikael Bridges. The, supposedly, the Houston Rockets have expressed a tremendous amount of interest in trading for Mikael Bridges. Sources tell the Athletic the Rockets have made an offer of multiple first round picks to the Brooklyn Nets. Four bridges in recent weeks. The Nets have zero interest in trading Bridges, who is part of their core moving forward. Emi Udoka is the driving reason the Rockets are making a push to improve their roster. Now, who would they be able to trade for Mikhail Bridges? Now, we all know that Mikhail Bridges this season is a guy who is making, I think, 20 million, right? 21.7. And if you look at the the Rockets, I mean, they're a team that they've got cap space, but the easiest way to do this deal is probably centered around Jalen Green, obviously. And you would think money-wise, if they wanted to get this deal done, Jalen Green, Victor Oladipo, and maybe like Tari Eason, all right, and yeah, Jalen Green, Victor Oladipo, Tar Eason would bring you to 21 million, and then you give them four first round picks. Are we are we doing too much? I mean, first off, Mikhail Bridges is a perfect second option. Okay, and the Rockets this season are a team that, if you look on first off, the the Nets haven't been great, but the Rockets are 23rd offense rating, sixth best defense, 13th and net rating with a plus one 35 percent three-point shooting team they're led by that 22 point per game score and shagoon who's also grabbing like nine boards eight and a half assists from fred van bleed who's putting up 17 points you got 17 also i mean 18 and a half from Jalen green 14 and 14 from both brooks and jabari smith who have both been defensive dogs cam whitmore's been on a tear lately tar eason's been great when he's been playing so has aaron holiday jeff green's been fantastic then you you know Amon Thompson's getting his minutes, and so is Jay Sean Tate. They've been solid defensively. They've had their minutes. And then you got yourself the Brooklyn Nets, who are the 17th best offense, 18th best defense. They're minus 1.2, which is 19th net rating, 36.5% from three, which is, you know, the 16th in the league. And right now they're a team that's middle of the pack. They've, you know, they're looking outside of the play in. They're, they've got two 21 points per game scorers and Bridges and Cam Thomas. Bridges is more like a set of co star, and Cam Thomas is a more off the bench guy. And then it's, you know, Cam Johnson, Spencer Dinwin, Nick Claxton, Lonnie Walker. Hasn't been great. And Mikhail, for me, I love Mikhail, okay? Like, don't get me wrong. Always have been a Mikhail fan since Villanova. I think he'd be a great guy for, you know, a team like the Rockets. And if I'm the Nets, I'm listening to the ridiculous part. But at the same time, with the way that the parody in the NBA is happening, I'm not trading him. I wouldn't trade him. That's because you can't find these guys. At this point, there's no big threes anymore. You got to build big twos and then get a bunch of good role players around them. Because a guy like Mikhail Bridges, who's the prototype 3 and D guy, great defender, all NBA quality, Iron Man, can rack up steals and defensive plays, can score. 
a plethora of ways all three levels can go on off ball cut transition scoring transition france break starter can spot up can hit shots off one or two dribbles he's you know an all-star and for me it's just you don't trade those type of players especially with the, the second apron now but for the for the video for the experiment i don't think the trade is going to happen but again guys this is just a video and i know people are watching this and they just want to hear this because this is interesting them and i do think because jeff green has trade value and he's on that deal cap flexibility tar Eason, jeff green and jalen green and then you, it's the picks right we got to do and i don't think they're going to trade brooklyn their picks but i think Maybe if they trade their own picks, they'd be more willing because they're they're not trying to be, you know, bad. They're trying to be good. Maybe it's three first round picks. I think it has to be three first round picks. Anything more. Also, they're saying this deal makes the the Nets better. So if you're a Nets fan, you're probably loving this. But yeah, this is the deal that we put together just now. Let me hear your thoughts. I don't think it's gonna happen, but if you're a Nets fan, would you do this? This this works money wise. Mikhail Bridges straight up for Jalen Green, Jeff Green, Tar Eason, the 25 first round pick, 27 first round pick, 28 first round pick, all Rockets unprotected. I don't think that'll happen. But let me hear your thoughts down below in the comment section, ladies and gentlemen. But yeah, if you made it to this video at the end, that's freaking crazy. Thanks guys. Peace out. Love every single one of you. And yeah, 56 minutes. Damn. If you guys watched. Some people watch the ends of these. This is wild. If you made it to the end, comment. I watched this full thing. That's fucking crazy. Okay. 56.